Welcome to Beyond the Label, a raw, real-life look at living with disabilities, presented by Century Martial Arts, the world leader in martial arts since 1976. CenturyMartialArts.com for everything that is martial arts. And now your host, Mike D. and J.D. Hello and welcome to another episode of Beyond the Label. I'm J.D. I'm Mike D. Who's our guest this week, J.D.? Uh, It's... uh, it's my old friend Tom Hooker, the chief of the Pittsburgh Fire Department. And you may be going, why do we have a chief of a fire department on a podcast about disabilities? Correction, <laughs> past chief. <laughs> uh, that's true, that's true. Well, the reason the reason we brought Tom on was to talk about uh, my time with the Pittsburgh Fire Department as a member. Uh, we thought we would kind of delve into how that works for me. Um, and then what it was like to, to think about, you know, taking somebody with a disability on a fire department. Um, so, Michael, I'm sure people are wondering where did we come up with this topic? And I was telling you uh, off air where we came up with the topic. So I'll let you uh, kind of introduce how we came up with the topic and then we'll get into it. Yeah, sure. So one of the things that seemed really clear um, was Jason started talking about blue bloods and it started kind of connecting. Oh, Apparently, what? recently there was an episode uh, of a detective who lost her ability to walk. Now they're wanting to come back to do their old job, but now they have a disability where they can't actually move uh, you know, part of their body under their own control. So that's the premise for the episode. What's really interesting is is like that type of thing to me seems obvious like of course they can go back to work and do their job they just you know there have to be a few accommodations maybe a van instead of a car you know whatever you can do some stuff but you know i, I can start to see the complications like you can walk up somebody's front porch and about it but i think it's a very interesting topic and worth the discussion for sure yeah and it, it's one of those things where uh i get it and and i was uh, i was pretty psyched to actually see it and this is this is two mainstream TV shows now that I've seen people with disabilities and storylines uh, bringing people with disabilities in the fold. So, so we see this on TV. It's happened a couple times. How does this play in to something like the Pittsburgh Fire Department, for example? Well, it, it was weird because I'm like, hey, I, I've been there before. And, uh, and yeah, I, I, but I can see it from both sides of the coin. I'm going like, okay, yeah, you, you want to contribute. You... There's still stuff that you can offer, but at the same side, you got to look at the other side of the coin. I mean, you're you're a liability. It's a paid department. Um, you you can't uh, can't function quite like you did before. Um, uh, you know, and 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 their reaction to it at first was the same as it always is to kind of shut it down. That can't be done. And and she just kept pushing, and and they finally worked something out. And so, as I said, I I hope that she becomes more of a regular character on there. But you know, how does this how does this play in for me? And and how does it bring me to the Pittsburgh Fire Department? And what's the point? Um, so up until this point, Mike, we we kind of tried to keep. Uh, you know, I do a lot of different things, but but we try to keep it uh, my personal experiences kind of out of the podcast a little bit, just so that it the focus doesn't become me. But um, there are a couple of people around the organization that were were like, "Wow, this is this is a super topic. You need to be bringing more of of these type topics to the table." And um, I actually received a call from uh, somebody from the. Uh, FDNY, who was a paramedic, who just had a stroke, who said, hey, I heard that you were on the Pittsburgh Fire Department. Um, do you have any ideas for me of, of things and ways that maybe I could get back on the job? And, and so it was like, boy, this is a perfect time for this topic. But uh, so great backstory for me is when I was in high school, about 16 uh, years old, I uh, my whole family was on the rescue squad and and uh i had some anxieties we've talked about in other episodes and and so it was thought that maybe if i had a little understanding of of the medical field i would be a little less anxious about certain things and so it was like well just go ahead and and take the class and at least you'll learn some stuff and and that'll be that well i got into the class i found that i really enjoyed it uh and as you know i don't excel at book work but i really excelled at the 
at book, book work here uh, with the medical stuff, found that I could do everything uh, that was needed in terms of patient care, except for lifting somebody, but there were enough other people to do that. Um, kind of let the certification go when I got into broadcasting. Uh, wanted to try to get it back a few years later when life settled down and basically it went to a national standard instead of a state standard. Um, I said, hey, give me my uh, certification back. I'll test out. I'll show you I can do it. And they said, uh, no way. I uh, can't, can't do it. You can't lift X amount of weight. And I'm like, oh man, this is like, I felt like that, that lady did. I was like, but you don't understand, like, I know this stuff inside and out, like, this is, this is life for me, like, I know, and they're like, nope, can't lift, can't do, so I was like, okay, well, what are you doing, and I'd had friends since kindergarten, I mean, I would say out of the 40 guys on the fire department, probably 20 of those went to school with me, and, and they did fire when I did rescue, and and they said, uh, hey, you know, uh, we could use you around the firehouse. And I just said, ha, ha, yeah, right. You know, what's a, what's a, huh? how's, a, how's a guy with crutches going to go? I said what Michael always says. I said, how's a guy with crutches going to go put a fire out? And they're like, no, no, you don't understand. Uh, you should call Chief Hooker and, and just talk to him. He, he, we got an idea. And uh, like, I kind of got the itch and, and my wife was like, yeah, why don't you give him a call? And I said, well, I'll give him a call, but I, I said, I don't know if I'm wasting his time or taking up time. Uh, it was right around Hurricane Irene time. So, um, Tom, I don't know if you remember me getting a hold of you and, and we just kind of talked some things out. I remember that quite well. Um, to, to give a little bit on my background here, I was kind of a forerunner in the fire service myself. Uh, I was one of the first ones to start a cadet program, which probably, I want to say over half our department came up through the, the cadet program, as Jason can well attend. Some of those kids he went to school with, they're now officers in the fire department. That started that, I think, back in the late 80s. Well, anyways, and to even keep going, I was one of the first departments in the state to have women, girls, in the department. So I thought when Jason came to me with his idea, I thought, well, why the hell not? I mean, there's a lot of things this kid can do. I, I've known him since he was, I saw him growing up in church, for Christ's sakes. On the crutches, <laughs> I knew his capability. You know, I said, this kid can do all kinds of stuff. I said, he's smart, he's intelligent, he's, uh, he's just a lot good, that's all. But so I said, sure, I said, let me talk about it to my officers, and I did. Well, the department, our fire department is set up with, with two factions. We have a hose company, and we also have the Pittsburgh Fire Department. The hose company is a social and fundraising end of the fire department. That's their sole function. And the fire department is a municipal fire department, so there's two distinct departments. Well, there was some originally some pushback on letting Jason, because back then you had to be a member of both to be, if you weren't a member of the host company, you couldn't be a member of the fire department. If you weren't a member of the fire department, you couldn't be a member of the host, vice versa. Well, that's when I, it came to me, I said, you know, I said, they're trying to dictate what the fire department can do. I talked to my officer, I said, you know what? We're gonna take this right by the head. If the host company doesn't want Jason on the host company, I'll make him a fireman. They do what the heck they want. I don't care. He'll still be a Pittsburgh fireman. He might not be a member of the host company, but he sure as hell going to be part of the Pittsburgh Fire Department. So that's how it started. I put him on as a fireman before he was a member of the host company. And it wasn't too long later they decided they wanted him as a host company, too. So that's how he got to be a member of both. And uh, he's been quite an asset, I think, to, to both departments, you know, the, the host company and the fire department, because it's a lot of things you can do if you're handicapped. You can be a dispatcher, yeah. you can do a lot of paperwork, and yeah. to yeah. kind of sum it up, Jason has become our uh, emergency manager director, management director for the town of Pittsburgh. So, I mean, that's quite a quite a post to uphold. So, I mean, it doesn't take a lot of strength to, to do that. It takes uh, some good knowledge and some, you know, good know-how to, to do that job. And he does it quite well. It, uh, it, it didn't actually take too long once, uh, you know, once they realized, but I, I finally got my host company uh, jacket. I think I had two votes. Uh, 
two, two rounds of voting. Um, so they, they mysteriously lost my votes the first time, <laughs> and so they had to re-vote. And I'm like, I don't, you know, I don't care. I'm going to be around. But the the reason I I what sealed the deal when I finally got a hold of Tom was, as I mentioned, it was right around Irene and. And me and my parents had the police scanner in the house all the time, so we were always listening. And, and you, the tone would go out, and you, and you, you get this, I, I don't even know, unless you know, I don't think you can describe it, but you get this, this adrenaline rush, and, and you feel like you got to do something, and that's the way I felt every time the tone dropped, was I felt like I had to do something. And during Irene, it's like I'm listening, and they were on at that point pretty much 24 24-7 for uh, a couple of days and uh, I'm just going and I'm hearing voices and as you as you grow up around this you recognize the voices and they're like I'm like that's an that's a an able body fireman Mike and they're using an able body fireman when he could be out there and I could be there and 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 I talked to Tom and he goes well he goes, uh, what are you? What are you good at? He says, I know you're on the radio, and you're and you're good at that. He says, uh, uh, and you, and I know you did paperwork and that type of thing for uh, the rescue squad. That's primarily what you do. He says you're you're good with computers. He says, how about a how about a dispatcher? And I said, well, I don't type fast and uh, I don't take good notes, but we'll figure this thing out. And. Uh, <laughs> And and we did, and it uh, it just he goes well. I'm I'm not good with computers, and nobody here is because uh, quite on, honestly, the average age of of the firehouse is is far beyond the computer age, and and so nobody was good at it, and so they had stacks and stacks of of paperwork that needed to be done, and and they didn't know you know what to do with it. And I'm like, oh well, I I can do that, and um you know it it was one of those things I. I felt like I could contribute. They needed the help. Uh, it was a good fit, and um, but but I also felt like I needed to learn as much about the fire department as I did the rescue squad. So basically, what you would see is is every time that they were having training. I mean, I was there soaking it up and and learning what they were doing, and and before you knew it, they said, uh, "Hey, you're good with kids." Uh, do you mind being a cadet advisor? And I said, uh, well, in case you haven't looked at me, I'm not going to teach him how to climb a ladder anytime soon. They're like, no, no, we'll get somebody to help you with that. We're talking about managing, you know, managing the kids and dealing with the kids. I was like, oh, perfect. I'm a kid myself. We'll be good. And so I started doing that. And then the, the host company, uh, an officer position came along in the host company. Uh, and they had said, I think think you should run for vice president I said uh, do you remember how the host company feels about me <laughs> and uh, so so I, I did I ended up came back to bite them in the butt <laughs> yeah so that's I was actually gonna ask so I want to backtrack a little bit and Tom just so you're aware we talk we kind of d dig into these things sometimes because the audience for this podcast isn't isn't just people that might have a disability but it's for parents family friends anybody who might want to learn and and the the question that I had was you know there was some resistance from it sounds like there was some resistance from the hose company up front and then later on down the line, after they learned about who Jason was and what his disability was like and how that actually affected or would affect them, that might have changed. But, it, it, which is great to see, but that initial, you know, resistance, was it, just from your experience, was it lack of knowledge, Tom? Was it concern of safety? Was it just, you know, this, you know, that he hadn't been around? Was it? Just a quick like perspective on that, perhaps. I think it was a combination of both. They were concerned of his safety around all the equipment because a lot of stuff we have is, you know, huge trucks moving in and out, and can he get out of the way quick enough? And I said, he's not going to be in the way. He's going to be in the office. Um, and then as far as resistance, yeah, I, I think there was some initial resistance, but then they saw what he could do, what he was capable of doing, his, his willingness to learn, uh, yeah. and even learn everything that we do, like he said, except climb a ladder or grab a hose. Just to give an example, we had a structure fire one night in the middle of winter, if I recall it, 
he came from his house on a pair of crutches because he couldn't get a ride from his house to the fire station. I don't know, Jason, was it night? Was it in the middle of the night? I don't remember, but it was late at night, I believe. It was late in the afternoon. Late in the afternoon, came all the way to the station on crutches. Now, if anybody's seen how he goes on crutches, it took him a few minutes to get there. And, uh, did you roll down the hill? I, I, I did. That's how Someone I picked we up didn't. <laughs> Can you see it? Jason gets to the hill, throws the crutches, rolls. So to back that up, now we, he's when the car's not there so that Katie can't bring him, he's got a golf cart that he can, he can hop on the golf cart and get to the station. Yeah. <laughs> so he's even got little baby boo to, to come to the station in. So, Michael, I'm going to tell you what he really told me when I walked in the door. He said, what the hell took you so long to get here? Did you walk? I did. I said, well, I yeah. Good friends. <laughs> so so he, he, he showed up even in the even in the toughest of circumstances, and that kind of that proved your salt a little bit there too, huh, J.D.? Yeah, because I can tell you right now, he's a hell of a lot more dedicated than I could name about five on my hand that aren't that dedicated. They're still on the department. So if that tells you any testament to, to his... Uh, you know, knowledge and, and wanting to be there, his fortitude or whatever you want to call it, uh, his dedication, yeah. I guess. It's uh, yeah. And then, so did the VP bid go well? Did you get the VP role? Uh, I did. I've been the vice president of the host company now for uh, three terms, I guess. Um, and wow. I, and I and I keep I keep trying to kind of give it away from time to time, and they don't let me. <laughs> give it up so uh that's that's a good thing in all fairness it's kind of a know-nothing job unless the president's not there so he doesn't have to do a whole lot of that job so so what you're saying is it's perfect for me then (laughs) you got it i was was vice president of the adaptive martial arts association for a while i know i know exactly what kind of (laughs) job mvp is Right, JD. <laughs> hey, you, you hung in there. I've been relegated to only working on podcasts now, so <laughs> if that tells you anything. <laughs> so anyway, Michael, oh. before we get off the tracks too far, um, yeah, yeah, I think that. Uh, so, so the point is, uh, of what what I'm trying to say is that uh, you know you really can't. You know, the old saying is true. You can't really judge a book uh, by its cover. Um, and uh, we'll take a take a bit of a break here, and then uh, come back on the other side and and kind of uh, uh, round it out with some take home messaging and and go from there. Sound good? Sounds great. Beyond the label, presented by Century Martial Arts for everything that is martial arts. It's no secret every martial artist, no matter their age, dreams of becoming a legend. A legend. Having their name listed among the greats like Bruce Lee, Chuck Norris, and Jackie Chan. You can hide it or deny it, but you know it's true. Being a legend takes raw talent, dedication, big breaks, and an ability to survive a roller coaster called fame. But it also takes one more thing to go with it. The best gear and equipment in the world. From the company that is martial arts. Century Martial Arts. They aren't just another martial arts supplier that's never set foot on a mat. They are martial artists and that means they know their products and use what they sell. From uniforms and training gear to weapons and equipment, Century has it all for every martial arts style. Although you may never be listed among the greats, you can still shop like one at CenturyMartialArts.com and unleash your legend within. Century Martial Arts, the world leader in martial arts since 1976. You're listening to Beyond the Label, a raw, real-life look at living with disabilities, presented by Century Martial Arts. Check them out at CenturyMartialArts.com. Now back to the show with Mike D. and J.D. And we are back. Thank you again to our sponsor, Century Martial Arts. We appreciate everything they do for us in this podcast uh, and also for Adaptive Martial Arts Association, uh, which is the the root foundation behind a lot of what we do. So um, glad that we've got them on board. So, J.D., let's get into we're having a is what I call a save it for the air moment, which is where we're having great conversation while we're not recording. Um, <laughs> 
So right. why don't you talk? Why don't you dive into the story that you're going to talk with uh, Tom about here? <laughs> okay, so just to just to catch people up, just if you are just joining us, uh, we're talking about uh, well, my being a member of the of the <clears throat> Pittsburgh uh, Fire Department in my hometown, uh, and that was. Uh, the topic was spurred off of a, a recent Blue Bloods episode where there was a detective uh, who was now wheelchair bound and she wanted to continue working and they were like how are we going to figure it out and we just thought it would be perfect because on the Pittsburgh Fire Department we figured it out so uh, with us tonight we've got past chief Tom Hooker uh, he was instrumental in bringing me on board uh, he was able to do what what I, as somebody with a disability, wish that a lot of people would do, um, and that was to, to look past the crutches and, and, and look past the, the physical exterior, uh, exterior and, and look at what my capabilities were, um, you know, beyond that. Um, and I think that uh, one, of those, one of those things, Michael, um, you know, we talk about, you know, Tom was instrumental in it. Um, but but I was also instrumental in it too, and and we both had responsibilities in this. It wasn't like oh yeah you're on just do whatever you want. Um, you know we both had responsibility. He like all the other 39 firemen, it was his responsibility to make sure that I was safe 24/7. Um, it was my responsibility, and this is where a lot of people. I think with disabilities, and I may get myself in trouble, but this is my opinion, I think a lot of people with disabilities assume that it is the job of whatever activity they want to get involved in, that that, that activity modified for them. And, and uh, I looked at it different. I mean, I, I feel that uh, ind individuals with disabilities need to know their capabilities. They need to be part right. of a part of a team to 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 make these adaptions work, and and that's that's what I've done. Uh, you know, we uh, we figured it out. You know, and we're, and we're still figuring it out today. I mean, we figured out ways for me to make things work. Uh, we've actually utilized technology now so that I can see the apparatus floor uh, on cameras. You know, sitting at the dispatch center. So. Um, you know, if you want it to work, it can work. But what I'm trying to tell people is you're just as responsible as the people that you want to be a part of. So, so, so let me say, was that something that you came to a discovery of through the process of learning in this environment? Or is this something that you already knew and you tried to implement right away? Well, I, I, I just think that um, because of the way I, I had grown up, to be told that you could do anything that you wanted to and, and that you just had to figure it out, I, I think it was an automatic sense of responsibility for me. felt like that was my end of the bargain. Like, hey, listen, Tom, you know, if, you, if you'll take me on, I'll show, we'll figure this out together. I'm not going to hang you up. Um, and, and did that approach, Tom, did that make it, did that kind of seal the deal and, and, and sell it a little bit for you? Yeah, it did because we we made some some adjustments in the dispatch center. We moved equipment around so it was handy for him, you know. And uh, because we never, when you set up some of the stuff, you don't think it might be somebody in a wheelchair or sitting in a chair that he can't readily stand up to grab a mic. So we we tried to accommodate him by placing the phones all in a strategic place, the the mics, the radios. You know, we have about three three different radios that he's controlling down there. Uh, he could actually dispatch most any department of the county if he had to. So there's a lot of things that we've accommodated his disability so that he can do it and do his job properly. And, and do you agree with that, though? It, it was as much my responsibility as it was yours to tell you what I needed and, and, and to be open about what you were asking for? And Oh, gosh, yeah. I mean, you had to tell me what you needed, and you did. And then we went about accommodating you. You know, there's a lot of things that maybe some stations don't like. We have a handicapped accessibility to the top floor with a chair that's got a lift chair in there. So that was already in place. So these kind of things just kind of all gelled together. So there's he's, he's you know, done a great job, I think. It's, um, you know, and, and the, but that's the thing is you have to, like, I know. So there's a, there's a point when you have a disability, Mike, that you have to say is like, Okay, I know this is what I can do. 
I know this is what I can't right. do. I know this is what I want right. to do. And you've got to figure out <laughs> a balance between all of that, you know? And, right. I and see I, a Venn diagram with a very small center. Right. right. You know, and I, and I think that um, a, a lot of people don't. They're just like, this is what I want to do. So this, and, and, you know, I'm not going to lie to you. I mean, I want to be there in the trucks, you know, going with the guys. But I know that that's, that's not where I'm needed. It's not a safe place for me. Uh, I know that I contrib can, can contribute even more with what I do because the, these firemen are not office people as much as I hate to burst your bubble. They're just not. They don't. Oh, a report? What's that for? Uh, we put the fire out. You know, so, but you, you have to, you know, do what you can, uh, do the best you can, accept what you can't do. And, and modify what you want to do. That's, that's the secret to doing anything you want to do. Got to keep an open mind. Got to be real. And, um, you know, that's, that's well, one of you on motivation. Oh, I want to cut in there. I think when you're talking about riding in a fire truck, I think I do remember one of the first days that, that Jason was able to, I think it was maybe just to go to a parade, as a fire fireman in a full dress uniform sitting in the passenger side of a bumper if you could have seen the look on his face you know that smile from ear to ear that you knew he was in his element and it's yeah. it it one of those things uh do you need help up in that engine no i think i got it you just grab my feet and we we figure it out you know um well, how are you gonna get up here well i haven't figured that out yet just grab my feet will you We'll get um, you know, that's that's the cool thing about the fire service is it really is. Everybody yeah. talks about, oh, it's such a brotherhood. It's it's a brotherhood. And, and it really is. I mean, um, you know, there, there were some times, you know, like a dress uniform. What's he need a dress uniform for? You know, and Tom was like, no, you know, he's a member of the department. He's getting a dress uniform. And so it's it's those little things that that make, you know, that you're appreciated that go a long way. Yeah. Um, and, and they add to this this piece of inclusion that we are striving for with this podcast. But that brotherhood and that camaraderie, if you don't understand it from the outside, uh, sometimes it can get you in trouble. And that brings me around to the story that we talked about uh, off air when we were in the break. Um, and again, if I offend anybody, well... Uh, you know, I'm sorry, but you offend everybody. It, it, Assuming you offend everybody, moving on. Right. If, <laughs> if I offend anybody, I'm sorry. No, I'm not really sorry. I don't really care. It's it's the way it is. Um, but anyway, uh, so so Tom and I and, and the forty guys on the fire department. Once once they got to know me, we we got a pretty good relationship. So one of my nicknames from one of the firemen is Gimp. And I'll answer to it all day long. Hey, what's up? What do you need? Uh, you know, um, so oh we, my gosh. we were doing a, we were doing a vote. Uh, it, it was an election, mind you. And Tom's up front as the chief and <clears throat> the town manager is, well, he's decided to join our meeting because as Tom told you, the fire department is part of the town and he decided he was going to come have some dinner with us and and enjoy the meeting and so Tom and I forgot he was in the back it was time to vote and there were no pencils upstairs and so Tom says hey Jay why don't you run down and grab those pencils huh and I said yeah I'll be back next year and we can re-vote again and we, we just laughed <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it was what it was and we ate and laughed and did our thing and he says uh, town manager comes up to to us he says you and you in my office and i'm like his office it's your office he goes no he's the town manager it's it's his office and he said do you realize that you can't say things like that and i said what he goes what well that's that's offensive and i said it is i said because if we didn't act like that then i would think something was up you know i said that's not offensive. Well, maybe not to you. I said, I'm the guy with the crutches. I should, you know, if it doesn't matter to me, <laughs> well, I should have matter to you. Well, you made me feel uncomfortable. I said, well, I'm sorry. But, you know, it, it is the way it is. I said, uh, you know, if if he didn't have the right to say it, I wouldn't have let him say it. And if he didn't, you know, he, 
he knew they, you know, they just didn't understand the brotherhood. And I'm not saying that you should be politically incorrect. I'm just saying that there's a lot of times out there that people are, they, they tiptoe around it too much. And, and they actually are, are, are making the, uh, the, the issue worse by not just being human. Well, I'll tell you, in the firehouse, Jason is treated no different than any of those other 39 guys. I'll tell you that right, right now. Right. He's treated just the same. If he's done something wrong, he gets his ass chewed out just like everybody else, whatever. And uh, like he said, we don't, hey, get up there and run over and grab that, will you? We know it's going to take him a while, but he, he will. Well, and, you know, I think that's so important. So we in the, the we have this pretty common theme that that in almost all of these podcasts that, that people with disabilities don't want to – we go back to the to – the, you know, people yelling at Jason because he's in a wheelchair, right? Like, do you know where you want to go from here? Like, because we need, like, yeah, he's not, like, he's, his disability isn't that he's hard of hearing, right? His disability is that he don't can't tell, walk straight. Don't tell Kane, right? he'll be in trouble. <laughs> but you get the idea, right? It's, it, there, obviously, if somebody walked up to you on the street and, you, you, because you're Jason and you have a thick enough skin. If somebody walked up to the street and called you, you know, I'm I'm using the word because you did gimpy or gimp or whatever. Like it would, it's it's a joke in your group and in your in your in your team, but not necessarily if it's random. But there's also something to be said for saying, hey, maybe that person is not trying to be offensive either, right? And and saying. You put it on your shoulders, Jason. You made the comment, and, and it, I think this is a bigger issue than anything else. Um, it takes it takes the person, the receiver, to create the offense. You can't be offended. You can't offend somebody if they're not going to be offended on the other side. So that thick skin, the lack of sensitivity, the fact that you just want to be treated like everybody else all kind of plays in together as one common theme, right? Yeah, it's just. Um, I, I remember one time. I think we we're up the haunted house, and Jason took a spill. And one of the guys come, "Hey, Jason, get up off your ass and do something, will you?" <laughs> I said, "I am. I'm taking a nap. Leave me alone." <laughs> oh man. Well, listen. We'll end on the high note, uh, unless you want to cover anything else, Jason. But I, Tom, really appreciate you jumping on tonight. It's. It's great to hear another perspective and what I'm seeing again, the whole point of my position, I'm the stiff on the podcast, right? I, I have the perspective of the general human being and to see again, a situation where with someone with a disability like a JD is interacting with people on a, on a scale as if they don't have one and everyone around him treats him as if the disability is what it is. Yes, climbing up the stairs to go get the pencils is probably something that will take a significant amount of time. So that's one, funny, and two, not something that in a 30 second time frame you're gonna ask him to do. So you guys are adapting to his needs, but at the same time, Jason has been able to adapt to the needs of the, the, the fire station, the host company, and say, here's what I can bring to the table and fill gaps. Yeah, Jason is not going to be the guy climbing the ladder to get somebody out of the th third story of a burning building. But at the same time, he's putting the people on the scene and getting them there. And, and there's a there's a way that he can interact and, and play that role. So, and, and also with the fundraising aspect of the department, too. It's been a right. great asset when it comes to fundraising. So, you know, with the silent auctions, all that stuff. So, it, it, you know, Haunted House, it all comes into play. So there's, I'm telling you right now, there's a lot of things out there that people with disabilities, I don't care what the disability is, there's something they can do, whether it's hearing disability, a sight disability, uh, you know, your limbs, you're missing an arm, a leg, whatever. But you can do something, I'm sure. I love it. That's awesome. JD, yeah. any final words? No, I, I think I think Tom said it. I mean, that's that's really the takeaway. Um, yeah. and, and I guess if 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 somebody, it's it's hard because because Pittsburgh's a special place. But I guess if you know if somebody wanted to to get a you know get involved in the fire service, I guess the first thing to do would be to to pick up the phone and 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 contact your local department and just say. 
look, you know, I've got a disability. I think I want to try this. And, and maybe the thing is, maybe you want to just, you know, shadow first and see if it's something that you can do. But, um, you know, again, like I said, keep an open mind, be realistic, and, uh, and give it a try because you don't know until you try. Yeah, man. Well, I'm Mike D. I'm JD. I'm Hooker. All right. This has been Beyond the Label. Thanks for listening to Beyond the Label. If you would like to be a guest on an upcoming episode, email contact at adaptivemartialarts.org. Beyond the Label is produced by JD Production and presented by Century Martial Arts, the world leader in martial arts since 1976. CenturyMartialArts.com for everything that is martial arts.